Good evening. Tonight we explore some of the ramifications arising from super flares, large CMEs, on the evolutionary history of Earth. We propose that the most powerful super flares or coronal mass ejections can serve as plausible drivers of extinction events on Earth and that their periodicity could correspond also to certain patterns in the terrestrial fossil diversity and the proxy record of ice ages. The entire geologic record could simply be a record of these cosmogenic events, the sun superflaring at regular periodicities. Now, if this is true, we've just come off of a superflare, and thankfully it's over for the next 100,000 years. The major super flares correspond to these upticks. And the last one happened during the Younger Dryas event. Now, if we extrapolate using plasma scaling each of the smaller events that show an instantaneous geologic upward rising in temperature could also correspond to super flares because there is a resonance time, there's a lag time where the heating events get stored in the earth and have later effects. Now the paper coming out October 17th, 2017, Risks for Life on Habitable Planets from Super Flares of Their Host Stars by Lingam and Loeb has been well-respected and you'll get the entire paper tonight and you can read it and understand it but we're going to break it down for you. Now, in the society we live on our planet, the major worry is the grid, the power system. Now, to get you up to speed with what we're going to talk about, let's watch a little introductory video on the solar storm of 2012 that almost sent us back to a post-apocalyptic stone age. And this wasn't just a single CME, it was a double flare, but it missed Earth, thankfully. We'll be right back. Carrington Class CME Narrowly Misses Earth, presented by Science at NASA. In mid-April, scientists, government officials, emergency planners, and others converged on Boulder, Colorado for NOAA's Space Weather Workshop an annual gathering to discuss the perils and probabilities of solar storms. The current solar cycle is weaker than usual, so you might expect a correspondingly low-key meeting. On the contrary, the halls and meeting rooms were abuzz with excitement about an intense solar storm that narrowly missed Earth. The close shave happened almost two years ago. On July 23, 2012, a plasma cloud, or CME, rocketed away from the sun as fast as 3,000 kilometers per second, more than four times faster than a typical eruption. The storm tore through Earth orbit, but fortunately, Earth wasn't there. It did, however, hit the Stereo A spacecraft. Researchers have been analyzing the data ever since, and they have concluded that the storm was one of the strongest in recorded history. If it had hit Earth, we would still be picking up the pieces, says Daniel Baker of the University of Colorado, who presented a talk entitled The Major Solar Eruptive Event in July 2012, Defining Extreme Space Weather Scenarios. This storm might have been stronger than the Carrington event itself. The Carrington event of September 1859 was a series of powerful CMEs that hit Earth head-on, sparking northern lights as far south as Tahiti. Intense geomagnetic storms caused global telegraph lines to spark, setting fire to some telegraph offices and disabling the Victorian Internet. A similar storm today could have a catastrophic effect on modern power grid. Now, I'd like to quickly interject here, because the important thing you should glean from this is that all of the events we're talking about whether it be the Carrington event, which was a series of CMEs over several days, or the solar storm of 2012, which was two CMEs 15 minutes apart, this is what will come. 
it will be a multiple event scenario where one solar flare after another after another layer upon each other and they break down the already waning magnetosphere of our Earth and they get at that grid. Grids and telecommunication networks. According to a study by the National Academy of Sciences, the total economic impact could exceed $2 trillion, or 20 times greater than the costs of a hurricane like Katrina. Multi-ton transformers fried by such a storm could take years to repair and impact national security. A recent paper in Nature Communications, authored by UC Berkeley space physicist Janet G. Lumen and former postdoc Ying D. Liu, describes what gave the July 2012 storm Carrington-like potency. For one thing, the CME was actually two CMEs, separated by only 10 to 15 minutes. This double storm cloud traveled through a region of space that had been cleared out by another CME only. Now let's discuss the resonance effect here in the ripples. You know about the galactic sheet that we talk about, which strikes off these storms. This is a different scale of the same thing that comes from the Earth. This is the sheet from the solar outburst of multiple events. And it is these multiple events, these ridges that ride behind each other, that come in to take out the grid. The first one knocks it down, the second one knocks it further, and the third one takes it out. It doesn't have to be as large. But more importantly, the 2012 event happened just days after another CME had cleared all the debris from the local uh, cosmosphere. So a CME had already cleared everything out. There was no friction, basically. And this baby moved at a fast speed. Only four days earlier. As a result, the CMEs were not another CME only four days earlier. As a result, separated by only 10 to 15 minutes. This double storm cloud traveled through a region of space that had been cleared out by another CME only four days earlier. As a result, the CMEs were not decelerated as much as usual by their transit through the interplanetary medium. Had the eruption occurred just one week earlier, the blast site would have been facing Earth rather than off to the side, so it was a relatively narrow escape. When the Carrington event enveloped Earth in the 19th century, technologies of the day were hardly sensitive to electromagnetic disturbances. Modern society, on the other hand, is deeply dependent on sun-sensitive technologies such as GPS, satellite communications, and the Internet. The effect of such a storm on our modern technologies would be tremendous, says Lumen. During informal discussions at the workshop, Nat Gopalswamy of the Goddard Space Flight Center noted that without NASA's stereo probes, we might never have known the severity of the 2012 superstorm. This shows the value of having space weather buoys located all around the sun. It also highlights the potency of the sun even during so-called quiet times. Many observers have noted that the current solar cycle is weak, perhaps the weakest in 100 years. Clearly, even a weak solar cycle can produce a very strong storm. Says Baker, we need to be prepared. For more information about storms, on Earth and among the stars, stay tuned to science. NASA.gov. I doubt it. I doubt that that's where you need to stay tuned. But you can stay tuned there if you want. We'll leave you the paper Observations of an Extreme Storm in Interplanetary Space Caused by Successive Coronal Mass Ejections, which came out and sparked that video back in 2014. Now, the scenario, if that had hit us, let's say, Earth-facing, it would have knocked the grid down, affecting hundreds of millions of people. Who would have gone crazy? And this is where major cities happen. So a grid failure like that, this is what you're expecting. So check the green and red zones. If you live in there, those are going to be no-go zones. So you want to get out of those zones, far away from those zones. Now, let's talk about the sun's wrath in recent times, because it's not discussed in schools. I didn't learn about it in grade school. I didn't learn about it in college. I didn't learn about it in grad school. And I wish I had, because 
my master's thesis would have been spectacular and I could have stayed on for my PhD. But there were other nefarious things going on at the time. The 1859 Carrington event, obviously, we all know about that event. The 1972 solar flares. The 1989 major power failure up at Quebec. The March 13th power blackout in Canada that left 6 million people without electricity for 9 hours. Multiply that by 100 or 1,000. That's coming. Seven times solar storms have affected Earth. We'll leave you this in the links below. And you can read all about the headlines. And what you need to know to prepare. That's to have food on hand. A Faraday cage. Things you want to protect. Maybe a CB radio. A local network of food suppliers. You want to know how to grow your own food and wildcraft and harvest. Because when this event happens, there's going to be very little warning. 48 hours maximum. And then it will happen. All your vehicles need to be filled with fuel. You need to have backup fuel if you want to keep going. So you can change the paradigm into Stone Age. It's going to take a while to adapt. Now, how the solar flares disrupt technology is pretty simple. One, the explosion occurs. The big boom. Two, the solar flare fires through space at very fast speeds towards Earth. And the 2012 event missed us completely. Once the particles start battering the magnetic field, depending on the strength of the field, it will either take it in or it will fail. And it may fail as close as the surface of the Earth. And then these particles get shot into the North and South Pole in the beginning. And they may even start to enter the equator. Changes to the field cause power jumps and failures in the grid. And we are going to be seeing some amazing flares coming through power lines into houses. Forests will light on fire. Homes will light on fire. Businesses especially. Major cities will explode. And it's all due to the fact that we live in an electric universe. The ionosphere will take most of the charge, but will take that charge down into the surface of the earth. And if there are power lines on the surface, they'll take the charge first. And the power will run through those surface lines and destroy everything in, in its wake. Everything that's not protected with a fail-safe or a power stop. And most of the devices that are available now are complete frauds and they will not help you. Just a waste of money. You need to be disconnected from the grid far away. 20 meters, wrapped in foil or a Faraday cage, wrapped in another Faraday cage, and then you may be safe from these major events. But otherwise, you're doomed. If you live in a major city, fires are going to be the number one problem initially. How can you protect yourself from the sun and giant flares? Move away from major cities and infrastructure. The initial map we showed with power grid failure Where is it? No. Man, I, I had to pick every one, and I still haven't found it. I might have erased it. There it is. So these zones where you see big transformers and power stations, those are the danger zones. During a solar flare, these regions will light up locally, and then you're going to get forest fires and burns. There's literally no way to protect yourself because the biggest problem is the satellites. As Elon Musk shoots 60 a day up into space or whatever he's doing, there will be hundreds, if not thousands, of objects entering our atmosphere and crashing down on Earth, starting more fires and even killing people. And many people are talking about the solar micronova of 2046. Now, I respect Doug Vogt and his research and other alternative researchers, but this date holds no credence in my mind. I, I know the proxy data. I know that the major solar flares, if they occur, occur every 100,000 years, and the last one already happened. So I'm not worried about a major solar flare. But minor solar flares may occur based on the proxy data every 26,000 years, may be triggered by the galactic current sheet and the magnetic reversals that we're well aware of. And these events are more, way minor 
compared to the major event which took place 12,700 years ago. So if you get anything out of this video, it's that, that the next event is not the event that's talked about in the Bible or any of the other events. That happened 12,700 years ago, and it's over. We're expecting a more minor event to happen now. And in fact, we are on a sea level fall surface where a glacial event occurs. So there needs to be rapid glaciation based on all the proxy data. No warming. And what we know from solar flares is that they warm the atmosphere for an extended period of time, causing 10 to 15 degrees C temperature spikes. <laughs> And I just erased the Vostok data. So uh, these vertical spikes that are unexplainable in geologic history are clearly not caused by Milankovitch perturbations because they're so minor. These are the super flare events. And the last one already happened. So we do not have to worry about another super flare. We do have to worry about a minor CME event. One that's like an SEM. A solar or a SPM, a solar pro, or SPE, solar proton event, which happened in 774, the Charlemagne event, which Native Americans have recorded worldwide in petroglyphs. That's the event we need to worry about because an event larger than that is coming, probably, based on all proxy data. But the major solar flare is over, thankfully, based on all data that we have on the entire planet Earth. Prepare at the ranch.com. It's coming. And the fact that you know that it's not the big one, you shouldn't be bumming. Here's the data. We're on the left. Zero point. The last major solar flare happened during the Younger Dryas event. Before that, 140,000 years ago and every 100,000 years prior. And these events, the proxy data, which I have never been able to, to come to terms with in my 40 years of paleontological and paleogeographical research. As a paleoclimatologist, we were trying to weave this into the Milankovitch orbital theory, but it never worked. But with the new data, we can now assume that the orbital perturbations of our planets in our solar system are driven by the solar outburst of our sun, the major driver of climate. And that it's the major super flares every 100,000 years when we hit the galactic current sheet that take us out. And the last one just happened 12,000 years ago. So we're good for 80,000 years where we can build the new society that we want to live in. Hope you got something out of the video. There may be a minor event coming, and it will destroy the grid. Send us back in the Stone Age and we will rebuild. Will you join us on the journey? I hope so. Thanks to all of our one-time donors, all of our supporters, and everyone that shares this video. This is the most up-to-date information you can get. We probably won't all die in 2046. That event already happened. So, stick with the facts.